Today's talk is part of our lecture series, Conversations in Forest History. Our guest today is Lindsay Borgone, an author, oral historian, and 2018 National Geographic Explorer. Her first book, Tree Thieves, Crime and Survival in North America's Woods, was named a New York Times Editor's Choice. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to our guest. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here, and we'll jump right into my presentation. I just wanted to say thank you so much for for asking me uh, to to present today. I'm I'm just really keen to uh, to speak with your audience and your membership um, about the work that I did for my book. Uh, so. <clears throat> I will, I'll dive right in. Um, I've got a, just sort of a quick intro slide about me. Um, I, I've not been too uh, active in the, in the society, so this is probably for many of us the first time that we've met. Um, so I'm a, a writer. I worked for about a decade as a freelance journalist before I uh, really sort of dug into into history and oral history work. Um, my, my writing has been uh, kind of a, a, you know, across publications, I've always been a freelancer. So uh, in newspapers and magazines like The Guardian, The Atlantic, uh, National Geographic. And I actually, uh, you know, during this time, I, I really sort of was able to identify an interest uh, in environmental history. And so I noticed that a lot of my, uh, a lot of my stories were uh, really either um, rooted in history or really I just wanted them to be all about the history. And so in 2016, I, I went back to school um, and, and studied for my master's in environmental history at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And when I was there, my my uh, advisor and the, the head of the, the, the kind of de degree in the history school there uh, suggested to me that I might be interested in oral history work, and uh, when he when he did that and and suggested some books to me, it just really I always say it like it, it really kind of cracked open my mind in a way, um, and it really kind of helped me merge together my experiences in in writing for a general audience and and doing journalism with uh, what was motivating me, which was uh, history. Um, and and kind of understanding the the deeper roots of of why contemporary news was happening, um, and so I I did my uh, dissertation was an oral history project uh, where I uh, did interviews in Shetland and and a few across the rest of Scotland about um, experiences of whalers at the end of the British Antarctic whaling industry, and there's there there's you know probably about a couple dozen. Uh, surviving whalers that that live primarily in Shetland actually uh, that that kind of geography has a real sort of deep history with whaling um, and uh, I, I really realized that this was something that I wanted to pursue and so when I came back to Canada which is where I live um, I, I took a job as a research assistant and an oral historian on a, a land use study uh, which was really quite amazing. It's tied to a quite a controversial pipeline project that's running through Western Canada. And this was uh, a, a land use study where we interviewed kind of uh, Indigenous uh, communities and Indigenous people in one community in particular, actually, about uh, their traditional land use along the pipeline corridor. Um, at the same time, I was really working and, and doing some research into a book that I had been wanting to write for, for years uh, about timber poaching. Um, and so in 2019, that I began writing that book. Uh, and so Tree Thieves, uh, it really began for me in 2012 um, with the theft of an 800-year-old red cedar tree. Um, and that tree was uh, rooted in Vancouver Island in a provincial park. So this is the, the stump of the tree, the remaining stump from that, from that poaching case. Um, and and uh, you can see here, this is the activist uh, Torrance who introduced this case to me, brought it to my attention. And this, uh, this, this really uh, kind of stoked an interest in me in writing about poaching and, and poaching as part of environmental history. And I began researching and, and kind of writing about poaching soon after this case happened. 
And I learned that there are hundreds of cases of timber poaching in the Pacific Northwest each year. Um, I think uh, many years later, actually, a, a story came out related to a case of timber poaching that led to a to quite a massive forest fire. And it said that poaching is a problem in every national forest. Um, and and that is certainly something that I that I found during my research. Um, and it's also an issue around the world, including, you know, in Eastern Europe, in Germany. Uh, there's there's news coming out now that um, you know poaching is on the rise in Europe due to the energy crisis. So it's it's quite a contemporary issue. But at the same time that I was following uh, these cases, I really started digging into the history around poaching itself. Um, and you know that that's kind of poaching for necessity and also poaching as an act of rebellion. Um, and once I started, reading into that, I knew that this was going to be a much larger, uh, a sort of much larger story where, you know, I did interviews with poachers, but I also really looked into some uh, historical records around poaching. And and I, I was able to really hear the motivations of contemporary poachers in those records themselves. So we'll get into that. Um, at that stage, I actually didn't really consider myself a historian yet, but I could identify that it was really the history that was compelling me forward into this story and into, you know, what would become the book. Um, the early chapters of Tree Thieves explores questions of ownership and human need and how the history of enclosures and the conservation movement uh, kind of left working class perspectives marginalized and and kind of out of the, you know, it essentially turned an, the activity of subsistence gathering and hunting into a crime. And so the beginning chapters of Tree Thieves, I, you know, I follow 17th century forest courts throughout that. They were known as Swanee Moats. Um, and that's where people were tried for offenses <clears throat> where people were tried for offenses that took place in the forest, including taking timber, poaching deer, often, you know, snaring rabbits, um, you know, maybe illegal uh, fishing if there's a creek or a river through it. And when forests were established really, you know, in the 11th century, so, you know, a very long time ago, uh, it was essentially for royal and aristocratic use, um, and often <clears throat> whole towns uh, and settlements and working commons areas where where people grazed animals or or you know gathered uh, plant items, etc. They were engulfed in this movement, and they were turned uh, from lands of common use or or kind of lands of subsistence work into uh, areas that if you took from them uh, became, you know, you would become a criminal. And so taking wood after this became a sort of folk custom. And it, you know, there was, there's really indications in a lot of the, the records that I was looking at that um, it became a sort of poacher versus gamekeeper uh, relationship. Um, there's a quote in, um, I believe it's Carl Jacobi's book, uh, Crimes Against Nature, which I, I really recommend uh, if you're interested in this. And it's anyone caught taking wood from private land, not only in the form of trunks and branches, but also bark and fence posts would be punished and cruelly at that. Um, social resentment then really grew around this, this uh, activity of enclosure and, and the taking away of, of access to the woods and, and the trees itself. Um, there were large-scale protests and trespass movements. One gamekeeper wrote that neither hedges nor trees are spared by young marauders, who are thus in some degrees calculate in the art of thieving. And these activities, they took place at night. They sometimes used nets and traps. Uh, groups of people would work together in stealth to essentially trespass and, and either take wood that they needed or leave a message. Um, crucially, I think, poachers often had gained the local sympathies. Uh, you know, um, there, were, there was a certain understanding in nearby communities that their acts were um, against the crown. Um, you know, they were, they were um, 
a, a sort of response to the, to the powerful and to an inequality. And this is a tradition that would continue on in North America during the early days of the conservation movement. Um, there are some really great examples, again, in, in Jacobi's Crimes Against Nature, where he talks about forests um, that had actually been logged by, by rural working people you know, as part of the expansion of the of the United States and Canada as well, West. Um, <clears throat> and those were people that were really, you know, doing the work for, for urban, maybe wealthy companies, um, and they were often the working poor. And when regions, you know, including the Adirondack Mountains, Adirondack Mountains became the subject then of conservation work, Often um, those conservation areas were include enclosing the living and working class environments that that uh, that those people were working within, and and suddenly um, there were communities of people that were living in rural areas, living in forests, um, you know, essentially just partaking in subsistence work uh, that were that were then classed as poachers if they continued to 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 take firewood or to hunt. Um, there are examples of houses being torn down, you know, of the harsh judgment towards those people and their properties uh, in written reports. You know, I think I, I detail it in the book. There's um, an example of a of a ranger, or forest commission ranger, making note that some of these properties are just eyesores and and you know they don't really fit in with with what a conservation area might look like. There was also um, lobbying from powerful sportsmen groups um, that that uh, kind of worked coincided with this. Um, you know, they they banned the sale of game meat, which a lot of people relied upon. Um, you know, both to buy and eat and to feed their families, but also to sell after they've hunted. Um, the hunting seasons that were put into place, they didn't actually align with with harvest times, for instance. So it meant that some some folk had to decide between hunting uh, and, and providing meat for their family or working and providing funds for their family. And so, um, you know, there was there are some real examples of um, perspectives that were not included uh, during the decisions being made at this time and how that eventually led to poaching. This engendered an anger, not unlike the anger that we that we heard about a bit earlier in England during enclosures. Um, particularly because many didn't really see their crime as poaching and felt that by labeling it poaching, they were they were being turned into into felons. So when I started writing about timber poaching that happens now, it was what was with this kind of foundational understanding of of everything that I had been looking into that, you know, poaching uh, was a really kind of fraught crime, uh, uh, certainly a very um, controversial label to put on someone in a lot of communities. And um, I knew that, I suspected actually, I didn't quite know, but I suspected that if I started reaching out to poachers who had been charged with poaching wood uh, lately, that I might hear some echoes of that perspective in our interviews. Um, and so Tree Thieves it consists of interviews with four poachers. Um, they all live in or around the community of Oric, California. They're all poaching redwood burl or burr, or in some cases taking down entire redwood trees. They often are, well, these, these four poachers are all kind of, uh, you know, they, they kind of orbit around the same social circle and they all have actually self-identified as the outlaws. So this was something that in my in my interviews, townspeople had had mentioned this term, the outlaws, to me. And uh, once I started interviewing the poachers and asking them about their um, their reactions to that term, I realized that it had really been embraced by them. So those poachers, their names are Danny, Derek, Terry, and Chris. They've all uh, poached redwood and they all are, are were eventually quite open about that with me. We'll, we'll hear from them. Um, so this is the inside of a large redwood burl. This is the type of wood that is sold to artisan shops that craft tables or spin bowls or carve art from them. And this is this is what's being poached and, and sold on the black market. 
there's actually a really long history of girl poaching in Northern California. And I would hear stories about that from, from people who were not outlaws. Um, you know, I was in particular, I have a, a strong memory of working in a local archive one day and talking to someone about what I was writing about. And he said, oh, well, my grandpa had a burl tree in the backyard and, but it wasn't uncommon for him to go looking for burls, you know, in the forest that he had kind of remembered where they were located, whether that was on private logging land or or in the national park itself, and so um, they use this language uh, around burls. They would they would say taking. That was really the 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 verb that that uh, jumped out at me throughout my whole reporting and interviewing process with this. That it was never the word poaching for them. It was always the word taking, taking a burl, taking a redwood, um, and. Uh, you know, I just, I thought that was quite notable. It also appears uh, throughout, um, throughout history as well. So related to that kind of long history of burl poaching, I have a story here from Danny, uh, and I, I, I'll play it. You should be able to hear it. I will note that I'm still, <laughs> as a, as an oral historian, I'm still really learning to, uh, ease up on my audible listening. <laughs> so you're going to hear me chiming in with with hums and haws and things. My girlfriend told me, she goes, Danny, if you would have been born in like one one era sooner or earlier yeah. in time, it would, it would have been fine to do what I was doing. It would have been fine. It would have been, nobody would have thought nothing of it. But in the, in the era that we're in, that's just not accepted. She's absolutely right. She's absolutely right. And I, I see scars and marks all over the trees when I'm up in the woods. Mm -hmm. I go everywhere in the woods. You know, I don't let I don't let berry bushes yeah. or nothing like that stop me. I'll I'll make my own trail, you uh -huh. know, if need be. But I'll go anywhere in the woods and, and I see scars and marks on trees. Yeah. I see where they've logged, I see where, where they poach burls, yeah. you know, fifty years ago. So that was Danny talking a little bit about, about that burl poaching. When I was interviewing the outlaws, I was really influenced by um, the oral historian James Bennett and his book, Oral History of Delinquency. Um, and he really digs into also Mayhew's work with young offenders in that book. Um, and I, I think that the oral history of delinquency is, is obviously really quite tied to an oral history of poaching and conservation. Um, and it's really um, an oral history often of the industrial working poor. And this was this was very um, foundational for me when I approached this topic. Uh, it, as much as what the outlaws spoke about was about the decline of clear-cut logging and a decline of industry and the impacts that that decline had on everyday life in their communities, um, on their income and access to services and the way that they lived, with their families and in their towns. Um, and in that way, my interviews really set to set out to expand on that and to include not only the outlaws, but former loggers in Oric as well. And this would become a really key uh, part of my process, you know, that there was and a, a key part of my understanding of this topic as well, that there was actually quite a thin line between being part of a community and also committing a crime in and around that community. My girl. Oops. There we go. So I've got a few more quotes here. Um, the oral history interviews that I did, they really came to focus on two key moments in Northern California and, and Humboldt County in particular, their history. So the first moment was the founding of Redwoods National Park in 1968. And then it's ex the, the second uh, kind of moment was its expansion a decade later in 1978. Almost all of the interviews that I did in Oric would mention these dates, um, and they've come to have the same sort of influence over perceptions around timber poaching that, for instance, other enclosure movements in the past had over poachers then. The interviews uh, that that talked about nineteen, uh, sorry, the uh, the founding in nineteen sixty eight and the park's installment tended to trigger stories from much earlier. Actually, so people would be telling me essentially family histories, often their families' migration to the region, the type of work that their grandparents did in the woods and at mills, 
And so this is one recollection from a community member who worked as a logging truck driver. Well, uh, my grandparents were here <laughs> as well as my wife's way back when. Her grandparents went up on the Ball Hills in 1894 and 1896. And uh, anyway, I was born here, not in Oregon, but in Eureka. Okay. And so I was raised here in 1940. And I watched it get big and watched it get small. So Oric was a town, it was built by logging and agriculture. Um, throughout the early 20th century, the income tax from logging actually paid for the town's schools, the churches, the road maintenance, pretty much anything that made the town tick. Um, and it paid for community social nights, uh, social clubs, and it paid for all sorts of ancillary services that made life in the town like life, you know. <clears throat> And this is something that was actually echoed by the outlaws themselves who told me their own family histories. The one thing about my dad that I do know mm -hmm. is that when I was just a kid, little guy, uh, he was the logging boss, oh. which is a very important job. He was the logging boss for Georgia Pacific, which then turned into the logging boss for Louisiana Pacific. And then he went into business for himself, which was Guffey Timber Cutters. And then we were the biggest jippo out there for Simpson. Yeah, we had quite a bit going on, and of course, we used to go up during the summers and spend, uh, spend the summers there in logging camps, logging, setting chokers, all that good stuff. Um, it, was, it was family business, and it's no longer. The interviews focusing on 1978, though, they, they really pivoted. They were, they were really more overtly negative, and this seemed to be a real turning point in the town's history and then also kind of in the family histories of a lot of the, the folks that I was writing about. Um, so, in fact, the, the loggers were, <clears throat> were right uh, in predicting that conservation, that the founding of the park in 1968 would decrease logging, and they began to kind of harbor that anger. And while it's tempting to see only how important it was to stop clear-cut logging, which, you know, I don't, I don't um, argue against that at all, there's still quite a few unheard histories of what that actually looked like on the ground, um, not, not just in the forest, but on town streets and, and in houses as well. Um, and in particular, many of the people that I interviewed in Oric, they mentioned a convoy of protesting loggers who took a large chunk of Redwood Burl, which is, this is it right now. This photo was taken last time I was there in 2020. Um, it's meant to be carved into the shape of a peanut. You know, it's really... Um, it, it's really deteriorated over the years, uh, you know, and they they dragged this this peanut, as they call it, to Capitol Hill in Washington as a sort of mode of protest against the park's expansion in 78. Um, it was carved into the shape of a peanut because uh, Jimmy Carter was the president. And so there were a lot of signs on the rigs that said things like, you know, it might be peanuts to you, Jimmy, but it's it's our livelihoods, etc. Loggers saw that expansion as the sort of definitive break uh, between their work and livelihoods um, and, and the um, sort of operation of the town. And they had been living also in a very heated political environment <clears throat> in the decades since the park came in. And, and they would really live in that environment for the next 20 years. I mean, you know, we were really at that point entering into the Timber Wars era in the Pacific Northwoods or Pacific Northwest. Um, and a lot of the outlaws and the, the, a few of the outlaws and a number of the people that I spoke to, their, their ideas around the history of the area are really linked to the relationships that they ended up having um, with protesters in the area and their experiences of what it was like living in this region during this like really kind of uh, political uh, very controversial time. You know, a lot of them were telling me about how they remember sort of driving down the highway uh, and having paint thrown on, red paint thrown on their work vehicles, you know, implying that there was blood on their hands. And uh, some of them remembered being out in the woods and being called murderers. And um, this was Chris Guffey, uh, who, we, who we just heard speak here about his dad's company. He was a bit older. 
but for the for the other outlaws, this was a, a really influential time. They were either in their early 20s or or late teens, and they were really hearing a lot of anger around them. They were really steeped in this um, in this dialogue, and it and it has you'll hear it has really stayed with them. But everybody, everybody around it seems like they're upset. You know, I mean, the park moved in. And everybody yeah. complains about the park. Everybody here seems like they complain about the park. Well, oops, sorry, just try to change the slide here. Everybody here. Sorry about that. So these were the interviews that I did that really came to contextualize the motivations of coaching that that I was that I was looking for. I was really uh, hoping to learn a lot more about why this poaching was taking place in this region. And I, I really learned that the poachers, they are the sons and nephews and brothers of loggers. They, are, they might not have always been loggers themselves. Some of them worked in mills, for instance. But it was all part of an identity. It was all really wrapped up in, in who they are and, and the town that they lived in. And I think that this was an important takeaway because their memories of what logging was to their home and to their family uh, have actually been influenced by that point in history as well. It's all tied up together. Um, not all of their own memories uh, actually are are their own, you know, they, they've really kind of taken on a lot of what was been what has been told to them by family members and community members. And in fact, Chris and Danny, they both voiced a pain that um, the opportunity to work in that industry, they felt it had been taken away from them. Um, whether that is the, the case or not, you know, I think can be is and can be debated, but it, you know, it's certainly how they see uh, the history of their region. And so when it came time to ask why they poached wood, their answers were really actually rooted in uh, community and family. You know, a lot of them were saying that they felt that they had no choice, that, that you know, that they needed money to live and that this was how they were going to get it. This is what they knew how to do. And some of them, you know, hearkening back to the title of this title of this presentation, they really saw that poaching as part of this greater tradition. A lot of them, you know, I was not presenting new history to the poachers when I approached them and said, you know, oh, there's, you know, how, do you know about the history of enclosures, for instance? A lot of them had really read quite a bit about this. And they saw themselves as following in the steps of Robin Hood. Um, they, you know, they really understood perhaps a, a deeper, um, motivation uh, of poverty and community and giving uh, to the people that they lived near. One poacher, Derek, uh, said that he was poaching so that he could put food on the table and so that he could heat his home with the wood that he took for his wood stove. And here's Chris Guffey chiming in again. It's it's a little bit difficult to hear, um, but you'll uh, you'll you'll hear how it, it links to this whole uh, presentation. Do you see yourself as part of that that tradition? Robin Hood's just taking care of his. Robin Hood was just uh -huh. taking care of his and his own. So that's that's Chris Guffey saying Robin Hood was taking care of his and his own. Um, and so <clears throat> that's pretty much uh, where these interviews brought me, and that that's what led to the sort of framing of tree thieves. I've I've ended it on a on a quote here from Rory Young. Rory Young um, is unfortunately and very sadly now deceased, but um, he he was an anti-poaching activist and, and he wrote a, a sort of uh, very influential manual on anti-poaching work uh, for rangers around the world. Um, and, and in the introduction to that, to that handbook, this is what he says. In his efforts to beat Robin Hood, the Sheriff of Nottingham makes many crucial errors which are still being made today. He allowed the perception of Robin as being a part and parcel of the community in opposition to the authority to become established. The sheriff therefore not only had to struggle with Robin, he also had to struggle against the whole community. Robin's greatest asset was neither his ability with a bow or his band of merry men. No, his greatest asset was the support of the people. And that's, I mean, that is, uh, really something that bore out to me as I reported this book. And, and Rory Young also says that, you know, poaching will, will not stop until we have uh, really addressed issues of social inequality. And, and that is uh, something that I heard echoed by 
by poachers, perhaps not in as many words, but in their in their motivations and in their understanding uh, as much as anything else. So. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so just a reminder that if you want to submit a question, please do so through the Q&A forum, not the chat. Um, and I see we're already populating the Q&A mm -hmm. forum, so thanks. Uh, Stuart Moskowitz. Yep, I see this. Uh, he says, you mentioned the four outlaws were part of a logging community. Did your research include any members of indigenous communities? Mm -hmm. What is their perspective now about this? Uh, and then he comments, when it was all indigenous land, of course, there were no such things as permits and, and poaching yeah. was not a concept they would consider. But to mm -hmm. that question of, did you, did you talk with folks in the indigenous community? I did. Um, so there is, um, there are a few ways that this works its, works its way into the book, essentially. Um, the first is that I talk a, a fair bit about wood buffalo, National Park, that's actually in the Canadian context, um, but uh, the establishment of that park was, was relatively recently, it was in the 1930s, 1940s, um, and, and um, much of the poaching that took place around that time was uh, was understood to have been uh, perpetuated by in local indigenous communities who, you know, this was their traditional gathering and hunting grounds and, and uh, you know, the government of Canada had essentially acquired this land through their own methods and, and, and tried to prevent that from happening. And there's a lot of activism and, and sort of uh, responding to that work, or sorry, responding to that um, enclosure that happened around that same time. So I do, Bring it in in that way. Um, I actually think it's really interesting in my um, in my interviews with the outlaws, particularly Danny and Derek. Both of them uh, brought up numerous times how um, they were. You know, I think the way that Derek put it was, in the end, this is Yurok land. This land was stolen from them, and poaching is this like kind of concept that's being applied. Uh, to our town that uh, just isn't uh, inclusive of or or kind of working within the context of the history of this area at all. And I thought that was, um, I was really uh, interested to hear it coming from them in particular. Yeah. Okay. Um, the final chapters of the book also, they, they address the work that I did in Peru, um, and those were Indigenous managed conservation areas that poaching was happening from. So it was in a little bit of a different context, um, but uh, again, it was uh, it was it, it, it was community land uh, that was having poaching being done by uh, by the market, large logging companies that were not respectful of, mm. of that land and, and government that was not trying to prevent that poaching at all. So it sounds like it was the re the inverse of what you encountered in Canada and the U.S. Yeah, but also so many similarities, you know, I mean, who does the bidding for those for those communities, uh, you're sorry, for those logging com uh, companies in Peru, mm. you know, the working the working poor, it was often new migrants uh, to the region who maybe were not as familiar with, with kind of traditional ownership being sent in um, and being told, you know, we can give you a pretty solid payout if you take out, take down some of these trees and deliver them to us. And so what you had is an Indigenous community being harmed by a community that also was, was really struggling with poverty. It was very complicated in that way. Um. And I'm going to come back to the fact that you were working internationally like that. Mm -hmm. But Mark Harvey asks, how has the history of poachers or takers of help to those charged with conserving forests or parks? Yeah. What is the value of this history to modern uh, modern day land managers? You know, I think um, I think that's a really good question. And, and it's something that I asked myself all the time when I was writing this book. I think again the the answer kind of comes from an interview I did with a poacher themselves who who really argued to me that no one had ever asked him uh you know about what would make him stop and um and no one also nobody had ever you know approached him and said if you want to be in the forest like do you want to work with the forest service you need and or or the national park or you know a state park or what have you and 
for a variety of reasons that may not have actually been possible, but I think that he had held within him a sort of resentment that no one had ever included him uh, or his family's perspective in the management of the land around them, um, and that that had really mounted over time. And so for me, I'm really interested in the impact that history can have in um, kind of softening maybe a bit of our stance as to, you know, how we, who we hire to conserve land and how we determine what land is conserved and how, um, and how we might see work and use as interlinked with conservation. I think that's a conversation that uh, can be really difficult to have, but um, that is really quite important. I will say that, you know, there's a, there's a project happening in Redwoods National Park now. It's called Redwoods Rising. And it's sponsored by um, the Save the Redwoods League. And it's really, you know, it's a really needed project. It's, um, it's you know, they do selective logging uh, in terms of kind of kind of bringing the park management up to date with what we now know are best practices, you know, for forest fire prevention and disease mitigation and all of this. But, you know, for a lot of people in that town, it looks like logging happening in a park where they were told they were never allowed to log again. And also it looks like other people being hired to come in and do a job that you've known how to do since you were like 12. <laughs> um, and so I think that looking at it from that perspective is important um, and maybe turning our gaze a little bit to say, how does this look from like the town's perspective can be helpful. Hmm. Uh, Sanford Kindle and... Mm. Um... Rahab Mitchell, both are asking about if you have looked into um, tree timber, timber thief in the in the southeast of the United States. Yeah, no, this is uh, very timely. The um, there's an organization called Adventure Scientists, and they they appear in the book. They do work uh, with a Forest Service lab in in Oregon, but they also have projects now that are expanding into the east and the southeast. Uh, particularly the um, black, I, I want to make sure I get the species right. So it's black walnut um, is highly poached around there as well as some oak. I apologize, I don't know the, the exact tree um, there, but it's on the rise. And so they are working to create a database of trees that are often poached in those regions um, that uh, hopefully they can work with law enforcement to match poached trees with the database DNA um, that they're gathering of, of trees in the southeast. What's interesting about black walnut uh, is that it has a huge growing range. So it's it differs from redwoods in that way. Redwoods are highly poached in one area of Northern California and Southern Oregon. Like it's very sort of particular. Um, but black walnut, you know, it grows, it's got quite a long range. And so uh, it has the, the demand for that wood has the potential to, to really affect a lot of different states and a lot of land managers. Hmm. Um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the book then. The different, just can you list yeah. off the general regions or areas that your book yeah, and where you where you are doing your investigation, so folks understand sure. this is not a Pacific Northwest story only. It isn't. No, um, I I I focus there because it is relatively uh, common here, and so you know there's actually more work being done around here, which was one kind of benefit of that was that there were some statistics. Like there there is a research gap in terms of the whole country, but um, you know much of the book. The book opens with an introduction that talks about, for instance, like the Mark Twain National Forest and poaching of cacti and succulents in, in Arizona um, and poaching of palm trees in Hawaii. And, and, you know, those trees are sometimes shipped to Los Angeles where they're planted in the front yards of like quite famous people. So it's really uh, quite a global, <laughs> massive trade. Um, I... I then dig into these cases in the in Humboldt County, um, Washington State in particular. Uh, Douglas fir and maple uh, is is poached in that in that region a lot, um, as well as British Columbia. And then I do look at it from a global perspective, partly because I think um, it's really difficult to talk about deforestation of any kind without addressing the fact that um, it's happening on scales that are just 
unfathomable in the global south um, and that a lot of the wood actually that makes up the furniture in our homes is coming from these forests that are so important to climate change mitigation and and like kind of the global environment um, and they're being turned into you know disposable pieces of furniture in our homes you know picture frames and bookshelves and there was there's a swift trade in in sort of sideboards that are made from from poached wood from India and, and Cameroon. Um, and so that is happening on a massive scale. Much of what I look into is on the, the very small local scale. Um, but it is really actually all quite intertwined and, and it's really bound together by consumer demand, I think. Um, yeah. And knowing that we we want what we want now, you know. Yeah. So consumerism is, is yeah. A, yeah, it's a huge the driving driver. forces behind this. So James Farrell, this is a good time to actually stop and ask this question from James Farrell. Do you, do you distinguish between illegal logging and poaching? And if so, how? Or what? how did you def, define or just, yeah, well, how did you distinguish between those or define <clears throat> those? Well, poaching is illegal logging. Um, there is, I suppose, some distinction distinction to be made uh, when a burl is being poached, often the whole tree isn't coming down, the burl is just being shorn off the side. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a lot of poachers would argue that, um, uh, that that means that the tree is still living and standing uh, at that moment. And so it's not damaging the forest. That is uh, not true. <laughs> but um, might, it, might it be a, a question of scale then? Yeah, illegal logging yeah, versus poaching. For sure. I mean, I will be honest with you. Some some people see illegal logging as like the industrial term for a company going in where they shouldn't go in and taking out trees, and that does happen. It does, you know, it does still happen um, mm -hmm. on a quite a large, not large. It's it sometimes happens in the Pacific Northwest, um, but I was interested in the cultural stuff behind poaching itself. Um, and actually, there is poaching that happens in the global south that is on a smaller scale that I discuss in the book, just because there are so many parallels between why it happens there and why it happens here. Okay. Uh, Did that answer the question at all? Not really. I think, um... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I see there's a question here. Yeah, Forrest yeah. Schomer, has there been any study of addictive substance use in Auric? So this was a this is a big part of the book for me, um, is looking into um, the history of these regions um, and how that history plays into some of the, the, the real sort of socioeconomic challenges that are on the ground there today and how that might link into poaching itself and the, the you know, the identity that we have around environment. And yeah, so uh, this was a huge part of my reporting process. When I first started interviewing, um, investigators and law enforcement officers, they would often say to me, we have a big drug problem. A lot of people that poach do meth. A lot of people that poach are, you know, maybe uh, not so much fentanyl, actually, uh, although meth and fentanyl use is now widely understood as linked. People were not um, mentioning fentanyl to me. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, I don't think it's outlandish to say that certainly fentanyl is a, is a part of the environment right now in the Pacific Northwest as it is everywhere. Um, this is part of the motivation. I mean, we, I did interviews in the book that talked a little bit about why meth is so ubiquitous in the Pacific Northwest and, and in a lot of these rural, often former industrial towns. Um, and you know, the folks that I was talking to in harm reduction and in abuse, like drug abuse circles, you know, they were saying to me that the link between current drug use and unemployment and also, you know, deaths of despair, which we, I think some of us may have read about, um, you know, it's highly, highly intertwined. And so it's, it's absolutely true that some of the, some of the poachers openly spoke with me about how they use meth and why. Everyone has a different reason. A lot of those reasons are related to past trauma. Uh, all of the reasons were related to past trauma, actually. And um, losing your job and community disarray and mass unemployment is a trauma. 
Um, and so these things are layered on top of each other. Um, there are people in Oric who are who are really deeply upset about what has happened to their town, um, including the, you know, one of the fellows who I interviewed telling me that we have three churches in Oric, Catholic, Methodist, and methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that is, it is a part of their lives, and they see it as um, a, a motivator for disarray around them, and that poaching is part of that disarray. So it is, it is highly linked, very difficult to, to, I mean, nobody has, has been out there doing field research into how many poachers do meth, right. but, you know, anecdotally, it's everyone mentioned, everyone, every interview I had mentioned it to me. So. And of course, the, the anecdotal evidence can get twisted one, however, it, it, however you want to use it. Absolutely. And right. like, I mean, meth is actually like the history of meth is fascinating. I know this is the Forest History Society, but uh, like meth they're, and they're making and, meth in in, on national in logging Forest towns. Yeah. Yep, they make it, and like meth uh, at at one point was like a worker's drug. You know, it's very mo uh, it's an upper. Uh, mm -hmm. It it uh, was developed to be used to make people more efficient, uh, and that is certainly how it's used in this context, right? Um, you know, I remember interviewing some folks about stigma around drug use, and and someone said, "Well, it's not like I use fentanyl because I need to work. Like I'm not gonna <laughs> fentanyl is a downer." And I was like, "Oh, I hadn't really thought of it that way, right?" Yeah. Like anyway, so it is really interesting perspective to add there. Ooh, um, yeah, in terms of solving the issue, it, it just that just points to the you start pulling on that one thread and mm -hmm. everything starts unraveling. Indeed. Indeed. Um, so I think more than one person has inquired about has the next along the lines of has the next generation of these families mm -hmm. accepted the change. Accepted the change, but you know, how are they coping? Um are they continuing to to poach to to make ends meet mm -hmm. or oh that's okay okay um this is a hard one to answer i think um part of what i what i try to dig into a little bit in the book is um what moving on looks like um and you know, for for a couple of the families, uh, there are a few big families that I that I discuss in the book. Um, they they live still in Humboldt. You know, um, they whether they live in Oric or in a maybe a nearby town, they are still in that region. Um, I recognize that in the context of Indigenous histories, this can sound a little um, trite, but um, they feel that this is their region. Uh, they. Some folks have have said to me that they're quite angry that it's suggested that they move to find work. And I think that that is a really uh, difficult thing sometimes to to think about solving, but also really important. So um, I think that they've moved on to other endeavors. However, those endeavors are still piecemeal work. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think that across North America, we are increasingly struggling with um, like gig work economies, and this is that region is no different. Um, and so, they they may have moved on from poaching, but they have not moved on from economic instability. I have not heard of any of the poachers' children poaching, uh, so I don't know mm. for sure. Um, but I do know that the ill will toward the park has passed on <laughs> has continued yeah. um so it's hard to say um yeah <clears throat> i think gig work is a is a really important element of this like there's just no way that that type of economy can replace what logging brought to a region mm -hmm. and it, it's really difficult to ask communities to uh to kind of strive towards that like they know that that can never fill the hole you know yeah, so. we see this in like in the Northeast and it's in Canada as well with the uh, paper mills, you know, mill yeah. towns. Absolutely, the, the mill the mill is now gone, and um, the maybe the land adjacent or nearby has been turned into a parkland or a you know yeah. national or state forest. 
And so now the economy has been reduced from this uh, dependence on the mill, which has just pays better across the board than yeah. um, tourist. Yes, and this is great. this is a really uh, the earlier chapters of the book when I talk about the 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 instation of the park in 1968 and the expansion. I think there was a real <clears throat> harm done uh, by proponents of that by uh, you know by basically insisting that there would be so much tourism to see these amazing trees that the town would seamlessly transition into a service economy. It doesn't matter how many tourists really you're getting it. That is going to be very, very difficult to uh, to achieve. And it did not work, you know, yeah. and I think that, again, this is very contemporary. There are communities dealing with transition away from all sorts of economies now that are going to be faced with this challenge. So yeah. the tourism I mean, as the golden savior, I think, is a, not a handful of restaurants cannot replace no. a meal that employed two or four thousand yeah. people or and you can't airbnb out every house you know right so um somebody asked did you in interview the artisans who made use of the post did yes i did yeah um i interviewed a few actually i interviewed someone who well, actually, some of the poachers themselves are artisans, and I, I think that's important to add. Uh, Derek Hughes, you know, he spins bowls, he uh, he carves structures. Uh, they're probably not uh, like you might see on a on a slick Instagram feed, but uh, you know that he sees himself as an artist, and he is one. Um, and I interviewed burl shop owners uh, who either sell to artisans or are themselves artisans as well. And it's, you know, it's very, one thing I was really interested in in reporting this book was the fact that like beautiful wood is, is just, it's very compelling for a lot of us. We all want to own it. I don't see there being any problem with that, actually. Um, there is demand, particularly in, you know, from maple. Uh, for like this beautiful kind of flamed figured maple uh, that that ends up that a lot of these trees are being stolen. They're they're sold for guitar fronts, you right. know, fretboards, these types of things. And I don't begrudge anyone wanting that beauty in their life. Um, and and neither do poachers, and neither do does law enforcement. And so it just so happens that that desire has led to this sort of underground. <laughs> Uh, economy and conservation actually you know I, I don't know if it has taken into account like the human desire for that type of product and and connection to a uh, to wood like wood as a substance not just wood as a living tree um I think uh you know there's a bit of talk about this in the UK there there seems to be quite a strong craft community there around mm -hmm. uh like just traditional basket weaving and and, and stuff like that, uh, coppicing wood for charcoal production and things. Um, but we, we don't always have that conversation here around, um, you know, how we can conserve and keep the value of, of that wood in our lives, you know, especially local wood. Anyway, I can yeah. go on and on about this. I mean, having a connection to local trees and having a tree that like grew near you in your house in the form of a table or something is a very special sort of mm -hmm. primitive uh, connection that we can have there, right? So I don't think that uh, asking someone like Derek to to not poach, to not turn bowls, I mean, it's asking him actually to stop doing a lot, you know. So did, did artisans who didn't poach, but they used poached wood, were they mm. aware? Of, sometimes yes, sometimes Did they no. acknowledge that they were using, we'll just say illegally sourced wood? No. Or, no, uh, some or of them. They, they talk off the record with you? Anything like that? Everyone insisted to me that they bought wood that they knew for a fact was legal. Okay. I don't know how possible that is. Uh, I also didn't have the paperwork in front of me to like prove, you know, like right. actually, you know, that this came from uh, from somewhere that it wasn't. It's very common to have forged paperwork you know, in Northern California, if you're going to sell a barrel that says that it came from your grandfather's land when really probably didn't. Mm -hmm. um, so no, nobody was willing to open up on that. Some people opened up when they had cooperated with law enforcement and, you know, to say that I accidentally bought this and I reported it to the police right away. 
Um, but that, you know, I, that's less risky to talk to me about something that was part of a case. So, yeah. Um, somebody asked if you interviewed larger scale loggers who may have consistently crossed property boundaries. So not necessarily that that individual, the Robin Hood type, but mm -hmm. the larger, a, a small company. I didn't. Perhaps. I heard stories about this for sure. And in fact, there was in the early 1990s, there was a timber poaching task force within the Forest Service law enforcement uh, okay. actions. And it was really focused on, um, you know, large timber companies that would consistently go over their allotted, their, their allotted, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the word here. They're, they're like parcels and their salvage sales and things that they had right. access to. Uh, nobody would speak with me on the record from that task force. I tried probably mm -hmm. a dozen people uh, who I knew worked for them or, or didn't, and nobody wanted to talk. Very controversial uh, because it is common for sure. Okay. Yeah, but uh, no, uh, I, nobody spoke with me on the record about that. Yeah, kind of a, everyone knows it's happening, Nobody, but nobody's going to acknowledge on the record that it's happening. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, particularly just because we're all in the Pacific Northwest, we live in the wake of the timber wars. And this was part of that kind of very fiery moment in time. And a lot of people don't want to go back there, you know, mm -hmm. um, which is understandable. Um, and I think that might sometimes benefit a company that might turn a blind eye to someone going a couple feet further into a into a cut block than they should. Yeah. So, so um, another question is, and I'm 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 going to ask the question as written and then uh, re restate it. Sure. What ideas do you have to combat the issue mm -hmm. of illegal logging and poaching in the U.S.? So the way I'm going to broaden that is to ask you uh, when you were talking to folks in law enforcement or, you know, on that side of the issue, mm -hmm. did anyone discuss with you uh, possible approaches? Oh, yeah. Solutions? I mean, on the law enforcement angle, there's, there's a lot that's happening. You know, there's development of technology that um, makes it far riskier for someone to go into the woods and poach wood. Uh, I discuss in the book quite a bit, you know, the use of hidden cameras and the use of, um, these special plates that can be buried under the forest floor and that uh, spring to life with vibrations from a truck's tires or even the sound of a of a chainsaw and will alert law enforcement where something is happening. Law enforcement uh, also, you know, they're very uh, they they in redwoods they've done studies to identify trees that might be targeted next so that they can be proactive and set up cameras and stuff around those trees. Um, there's DNA work being done by labs, particularly in, in Oregon, who are um, creating databases that create DN that hold DNA profiles for, uh, for, for at risk of poaching trees, so that if wood is, uh, you know, uh, found to be suspected to be illegal and found in a mill, that that wood can then be tested against the database to identify where it may have come from. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of technology work being done there. Yeah. Uh, there might not be as much uh, social uh, or kind of cultural uh, uh, work being done. I don't know if that's the law enforcement agency's responsibility, to be honest with you. I think that we could have some discussion around that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it is, it's highly responsive is what I would say what the work that's being done now. So how can we prove that someone did poach this wood to then make it uh, more of a risk for people to go forward in the future with poaching and less like preventing at the base level why someone might do it. So, so it, it sounds a little like they're with the law enforcement, it's um, treating the symptoms. Yeah. And I think that that's, but, but I not mean, the, yeah, it, it take, it's going to take more than that to address the larger yeah. socioeconomic issues that keeps driving this. Yeah, and I think that can be said across the board for all sorts of yeah. law enforcement challenges, and it's not their fault. Like, my God, everyone is dealing with funding, and like, I'm yeah. sure if the Park Service had unlimited funds to handle this, they could set up all sorts of social projects and things like mm -hmm. that. You know, everyone, 
I do genuinely believe people are trying their best, uh, but the systems are really deep as well. Uh, yeah. It's very, it could be very hard to enact change within that. So on the other side of this, Fred asks, um, if poachers had, and, and communities had their own um, recommendations for proceeding to, to improve yeah. the, the situation, what, what were you hearing from that side? I think, uh, you know, there was a quote, um, I was just, I'm just so lucky, honestly, that, that so many people on all sides of this opened up to me. And, uh, in, in one of my many conversations with, with Derek, the poacher, you know, near the end, he said to me, <clears throat> you know, I don't see my neighbor charging me with this. And I thought that that was actually a really important, uh, hmm. suggestion, which is that often in these larger state or federal, uh, uh, systems, departments, what have you. Hiring can uh, can take place in all sorts of ways. Redwoods is a is an in demand place to work. This means that actually, for instance, the superintendent there now he came from Shenandoah National Park, which is like all the way on the other side of the country, and he's from Pennsylvania. He's so smart. Like I really respect him a lot. He's not local. Mm -hmm. He has to catch up on local contexts on. You know, this is a big problem in that park. So he's trying to learn from people around him why uh, those people around him probably came from elsewhere. In fact, I know a lot of them did. They moved up from maybe Southern California even. I think like, I think that there is some room for some proactive change in, in how people are recruited and promoted and whatever within these systems. I, I do think that. Um, so that is, I think when... I think the nub of of what Derek was saying to me, you know, that my neighbor isn't the one charging me. I think that that's really what he is saying, you know, like, I, I don't know these people, <laughs> like, like, they don't know me, they don't know my contacts, blah, blah, blah. So mm -hmm. there might be some, some room for dissuasion by, in, by inclusivity in that way. You know, for current poachers that Un is very unlikely to happen. Many of them already have records that would preclude them from being employed by the federal government. Mm -hmm. But if we want to prevent poaching 20 years from now, that right. might be one way to, to, to do that. Um, okay. Um, I'm looking at keeping an eye on the clock. Um, yeah, I have time for a few more. Okay. Alex, so to kind of round this out then, uh, Alexandra asks if you were able to talk to environmental groups that were yep. protesting. Okay, so fill us in on that. I was, yeah, no, I did some interviews with uh, members of Save the Redwoods League um, who who really spent their time. Um, that was a very, uh, very hard uh, time to be getting a point across. You know, I actually really spoke to... Um, uh, to to those folk in the context of the Timber Wars and Redwood Summer, which was this event that was going to be taking place in Humboldt in the summer of 99, mm -hmm. I think, if I remember correctly, um, which was organized by a woman named Judy Bari. Um, Judy was, was quite um, influential in the Earth First movement in Northern California. She's sadly no longer with us, but uh, has left behind like quite an extensive uh, archive, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I spoke with her and I spoke with uh, other members of Save the Red, sorry, pardon me, Save the Redwoods League. There actually was some oral histories collected by UC Berkeley um, that I was able to access um, that were with, uh, I think, Daryl Cherney, who was also a member of the Earth First movement. Um, and I have to be, let me just think a little bit about how I, how to phrase this. Like, it, it, that was a very fiery, violent time on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have absolutely no, like people were, protesters were having their lives threatened in the middle of a very kind of inaccessible forest where people were like throwing axes at their head and yelling at them and using really kind of very uh, scary language. Yeah. And I would not take that away from them. At the same time, there are quotes from Judy Bari at rallies in Eureka talking about how folks in Humboldt County are inbred and like, you know, like the language was very, 
the, the, the conflict there was really on both sides, you know, and um, I think that in the conservation movement, there has been a real challenge with class inclusivity. Um, mm -hmm. And it is something that I think, unfortunately, some folks might, some organizations might still struggle with today. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's a, it was a hard, um, it was a hard line to tread because I don't disagree with what the with what protesters were fighting for. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that their perspective is in the record a bit more obviously than others. So it, it sounds like you were finding with each group you spoke with, you found they each had valid points. Rhetoric and, and all that aside, they each had valid points, but then there was never or, or maybe to tell me if, if they've ever gotten all the groups or most of the groups to sit at the table okay. and, and discuss. No, I mean, quite famously, Bill Clinton and Al Gore yeah, tried to that. do this but, in yeah. 1994 at the at the Port Portland Forest Summit um, at the conference center in Portland. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean that those those the the um, those meetings are still available on C-SPAN. I would actually just recommend that anyone watch them. They are absolutely fascinating, mm -hmm. and that really got that brought together so many perspectives. That you know there were perhaps not people talking about poaching, but there were people uh, talking about how like their businesses had gone under and they lived out of cars, you know, and there were uh, there were religious clergymen talking about how they were handling like. Um, like a suicide epidemic in these communities where men were so um, kind of hopeless that this was happening. And at the same time, you know, you've got all the major environmental groups were there, all the major uh, decision makers in the federal government were there. That provided an airing out. Uh, it did not provide a peacemaking okay. situation. Yeah. That's, that's a good way of describing that um i think there's my, value my in airing out no i do was happy with the end, no. end decision <laughs> um, no which maybe was the only way forward uh, yeah. you know I, I i who am i to to solve the timber wars uh, you know i don't know <laughs> but uh, and i do think that there's value in in that airing out uh it may be that airing out over the span of one weekend and then never returning yeah. uh may not have been the right tactic because you then, you know, especially in the context of the federal government, you've then got all of your decision makers flying east home, and you've now just left an entire group of people, um, you know, with their very vulnerable. So, yeah. So, and then the the, the problem continues. Continues. It doesn't actually yeah, disappear, it, it, right? Yeah. yeah. Which, and we live in the wake of of a lot of what those people predicted would happen. Here. Mm -hmm. So, um, trying to find one to, to end on. Um, oh, there's so many good ones. That's, there that's is challenge. like Drew is it, Heiderscheidt's question about capitalism. Great. Yeah. I mean, wanna, <laughs> it says, wanna, I'm curious how this work connects with issues surrounding capitalism and capital accumulation. In particular, how do you see this connecting with historical moments of primitive? accumulation such as what occurred in England. I'm especially considering the ways that criminalizing the use of common lands was one of the primary ways that lower class people were forced to rely. Yeah, I mean, you've basically just said it, which is great. Um, you know, I think there's a certain amount of irony in the fact that uh, a lot of poachers and their dads and granddads, and I say it is highly male. Um, there is actually some there are some discussions around how women have been involved in poaching, but my reporting ended up bearing out as highly male, so I kind of use that. Anyway, um, there's some irony in the fact that they, uh, in their work, you know, they're being told, you are expanding America, you are making this country, I hate to say this because it's nasty and it's been twisted and turned, but a lot of the wording really was, this is a great country because of you, you are making this country you know, your work is like fueling hmm. democracy and all of this. And uh, as as um, kind of massive deforestation was taking place in the post-war era, because like technology had enabled all of this kind of like clear-cut logging to take off, 
you know, that the, the messaging continues as like, you are funding like our prosperity and you have a family and that family is coming from this amazing work that you do that nobody else can do. And then once they've been encouraged and told actually by corporate, you know, entities to keep going, to keep going, oh, suddenly now we have to stop. I mean, that's, that's neither their fault. That, that, that is the fault of, of greed, of capital mm -hmm. accumulation, of looking five years down the line, not 75 years down the line. And, you know, I do find it, um, I do find it a little bit disconcerting to, to see some of the rhetoric in, in the past that has been lobbied toward loggers themselves, as opposed to perhaps a logging baron or a, you know, not even that. I mean, my God, we see with Maxim, it was a, it was a hedge fund manager, mm -hmm. you know, like just really kind of, it had become divorced from the work itself. And I think that that's, that, that, that's a really important point to make. And I think that um, that maybe hasn't always been communicated on the workers level uh, well. And we can talk a little bit, of, you know, of course, about why that might be. But um, yeah, I think that it's that it's really highly linked to, to accumulation and, and capital kind of capital works and things. Um, mm -hmm. Ways that criminalizing the use of common lands was a primary way that lower class people were for yeah so that's precisely it you know you've got a generation of people whose livelihood is is relying on uh wage labor i think we could go down a whole other line of of kind right. of the role of unions in this of course um and and how unions have shifted their approach to to environmental work over time but um yeah <laughs> there, I don't know if that answers it, but I'm fired up by that question. So, <laughs> yeah, I think Drew could probably write us an essay on it. So. Sounds like it. Yeah. Um, well, I'm wondering so, how you're. How, yeah, charismatic mega. I'm sorry. I'll just answer this one more no, no. from Nikki. Um, I'm one yeah. Nikki who says that they've lived actually near Redwoods National Park and lived in Oric. I'm wondering how your case studies in the PNW that has very charismatic megaflora and an intense history compared to other transnational cases. So I think that's really important. Um, Stephen Troy, who last I know is the, um, the, the superintendent of Redwoods National Park, he characterizes Redwoods as the rhino of the P American Pacific Northwest. And I think that that is why the focus of poaching on Redwoods has been actually like more so than other timber and other plant species in North America. Mm. Um, they're just imposing and beautiful. And we've been told through all sorts of narratives that they are like our version of a cathedral. Like they're often, you know, put in line with almost like God-like images and religious right. images. But I mean, we have, there's a real issue with poaching of succulents <laughs> all throughout the United States. There's ginseng poaching. Um, and they, they don't have the same uh, sort of visceral effect that you might hear of, that you might feel when you hear of a redwood poaching, or even trees that are endangered in other parts of the world that are less known because they're not within our daily sort of understanding of what grows in our backyard. Um, and so this is something that the timber, the illegal timber industry struggles with, because actually most of the endangered and, and illegally traded uh, uh, flora and actually fauna in the world are our trees, but you know we focus more on rhino, um, elephant tusk, etc. So there are some yeah. questions around that for sure. The, the yeah the charismatic make of flora and fauna. And, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think we'll we'll go ahead and um, wrap. Thank things you for up. these questions; they're amazing.